Good afternoon folks, welcome back to Higher Chemistry. Uh, we are still pursuing nature's chemistry, organic chemistry in other words, and we're having a look at uh, soaps, emulsions and detergents. Not necessarily in that order right enough. Uh, this is SQA documentation, page 68 to 70, and Scholar, page 127 to 147. I'd like to cover these four um, learning outcomes in today's video. Excuse me. Um, the four learning outcomes are: What do we make soaps and uh, what do we make soaps from? There is a massive degree of irony there. We'll see in two seconds. What are the properties of these soap molecules? That's not perhaps the best word for it. You'll see in a second why. Uh, and how do they do the magic of making oil and water a mix? Um, Apparently, dissolving non-polar oils into polar water. Now, that should be impossible. You could pause the video and tell me why, of course. Um, we'll have a look at how this piece of um, magic is done. It's actually a sleight of hand. It's actually cheating. Because the simple answer is you can't. You cannot make oils and fats mix with, dissolve properly with water. So we'll come back to that in a second. What is the problem with scum here? This does not affect us very much in Scotland, but in a previous life I taught down near London and, boy, should have seen the inside of the kettle. Um, we'll come back to uh, what that is in just a second. It's, it used to be in... Anyway, it doesn't matter, I won't give you a history lesson. And emulsions and emulsifiers. Um, that's the four things I would like to cover today. So, uh, first, before we start, here's a quick word from our sponsors. Um, Graham's Butter and Dove Soap. Uh, you see, I did say there was a degree of irony. It turns out that we make soaps from fats and oils and then use the soap to clean up the fat and oil. Isn't the world a very circular place? I, I'm going to have to go and put the butter back in the fridge. Please excuse me. So let's uh, let's cover just exactly how that. How on earth do you turn a fat or an oil into a soap? Well, here's a, here's a molecule. From this family, I, again, if you want to pause the video, you could challenge yourself to tell me, of course, what type of homologous series is a fat and oil. See if you can dig that out of your memory. And also, could you tell me if this right here is, in fact, a fat or an oil? There is a way to tell, and there is a definite answer to that. So, if you want to pause the video, feel free um, to shout at the screen. In the meantime, let's take this molecule here, and let's hydrolyze it. So, we're going to do hydrolysis on it now. I have done a video on the definition of hydrolysis. If you're a bit shaky, go back and have a look at that. And what we're going to do is we're going to split these ester links here. And we are going to create the alcohol that's common to all fats and oils, which, once again, pause the video and tell me what the answer is. So we're going to create this propan 123 trial otherwise known as glycerol or glycerine, and a variety of other things. Uh, famous for being uh, used in gummy bears to make them chewy, famous for um, putting in shampoo to make it gloopier, and also famous for turning it into nitroglycerine and using it as explosives. Please don't try that one at home. But we're not too interested in this. What we are really interested in are these three molecules here. Now, these should be, if you are following a hydrolysis idea, you would expect us to make three molecules of this. And you would be right, except for the conditions that we actually do this under. Because this isn't a hydrolysis with water. You can't just boil up fats and oils with hot water. It'd be a pity. Actually, they would just fall apart and you would never need any soap. These are too strongly created for that. The bonds are too strong. But if you are, in fact, doing this in what are called alkali or basic conditions, so if you use some sodium hydroxide in the water, you don't just do the three splits, which does work, by the way. Excellent. But please remember that this is a carboxylic acid. Now, the key word here is acid, and they behave like acids. I've yet to make a video exploring the exact chemistry of them that I really must. Now, acids react with alkalis, or bases, to form salts. And in the case of, say, hydrochloric acid, that hydrogen chloride reacting with sodium hydroxide, 
you make, of course, sodium chloride and the hydrogen, and this tells, teams up to form um, a molecule of water. Let's keep the colour code consistent, shall we? There we go. So that's what happens, like that was like National 5 stuff, but the same thing happens here. So we lose the hydrogen off the acid and it teams up with the OH. Which hydrogen do we lose from this one? Well, we actually lose that one. So that will team up with the hydroxide and form water, leaving you with what? It leaves you with this. It leaves you with an ion. Now, uh, these are carboxylic acids. This is a carboxylate ion. Um, and of course, in the water, we tend to find sodiums with a 1 plus, so we often represent it as this. That implies that this is joined up, and that's true in the pure solid, but not in the water, because this is ionic, of course, so this falls apart. But my point being um, that what we've done is not just produce three molecules of carboxylic acid, we've produced three molecules of the salt of this carboxylic acid. And that's why it's done under alkaline conditions. This has a couple of advantages. These are soluble in water. The carboxylic acids are not. Not really well. They're not that great at dissolving water. But this is nice and soluble in water. Uh, that means, and so is this, nice and soluble in water. That means that we started off with something that did not want uh, to mix with water. And we end up with this and this that do. So, in other words, uh, we produced this, by the way. This is the molecule we're looking for because this is actually... A soap. So, uh, topic number one was I wanted to know what they are made from. And the answer to that, the being sorry, I wanted to know what soaps are made from. The answer is soaps are made by alkaline hydrolysis of a fat or an oil. And you end up making the sodium salt of the carboxylic acid, the fatty acid salt, um, because you've done it in alkali conditions. My second uh, point is I wanted to have a look at the properties of some of these soap molecules. Now, for simplicity, I'm just going to draw the soap molecule like this. Um, I showed you this before in, I think, in one of my uh, videos. Uh, this is called skeletal representation. Every time you see an angle change, that's a carbon atom. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10... 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, close enough. Uh, and then we have our C double bond O and O negative. Now I'm hoping that you can see that there's a whole big mass of line of carbon to carbon bonds here. Uh, and the only other atom involved is hydrogen. Now the delta En is very small, which means if you pause the video, I'm hoping you can tell me about the polarity of this part of the molecule. And if you look at this part of the molecule, you will find it's actually got a negative charge. So, this part here is most definitely polar. You can't get much more polar than an ion. And down here, at the other end, this all the electronegativities of these are very similar to each other, so therefore you have a big, long, massive non-polar tail on this molecule, effectively. That's how people tend to represent it. And the difference in polarity within a single molecule is what enables it to do its party piece. It enables this molecule to either enjoy dissolving in water at this end and also to enjoy dissolving in oils and fats at this end. So it's got like a dual um, purpose molecule here. Two for the price of one. Let's have a look at how that helps us clean up our frying pans when you go off to be a student in student land. So here's my seriously dodgy representation of a pan from a student flat that some swine had a big fry up in and didn't clean it behind them. Not that I'm bitter or anything, remembering first year university life. So we've got the pan and we've got a layer of oil on it. Now what we're going to do, of course, is we're going to plunk water into it. So we fill up the pan with water and absolutely nothing happens because this is all polar and this is all most definitely non-polar. So what we do now is we take our pan and we put a little squish of soap into it. 
So we're going to add the magic molecule. Um, so we're going to add... Uh, I'm hoping you can see that. Okay, can we see? Oh, it's not a great green colour. Excuse me. I'll just redo that. Something better. So we are going to add ourselves some soap molecules into this mixture. Still nothing happens, believe it or not, until you actually take a, a brush or a sponge or whatever and give it a little shugle around. Good technical word, that. Um, what happens now is you end up... Apparently, from the outside world, looking like you've managed to make the oil mix with the water because it, it takes all the oil off the surface of the pan. If you look carefully at it, though, you'll find the water is slightly cloudy. Now that's a giveaway that it's not a proper solution. And in fact, what we've actually got on the microscopic scale, it's very cool chemistry actually, you've got microscopic blobs of oil dispersed throughout the water and that's why it's slightly cloudy, it's why it's not completely transparent. And the microscopic blobs of oil have got dissolved in them soap molecules in a particular orientation. The tail, the non-polar tail, of the soap molecule dissolves into the little microscopic blobs of fat or oil. So the sugary, the little brown sugars here are meant to be... I might draw a bigger version of this actually, just to make it clear. Yeah, let's do that in fact. Let's do a bigger version of hay. So here's a magnified version. And here's the carbon chains. There are meant to be 17 of these of course. I've run out of space. And then sticking it out into the water is the polarised end. So this is non-polar, and this part here is polar. So we've got chains of carbons here, and then double bond O, and a little O minus. Now, if that was all there was to it, it wouldn't be quite so clever. Because all these blobs, when they touched each other, would just reform as a big thick layer of oil. You might want to pause the video and see if you can figure out why that does not happen. Well, it does happen, but it takes hours and hours and hours to do, believe it or not. You want to try a home experiment, go home and get a monkey frying pan, put some soapy water, stir it around, and then leave it overnight. You will eventually get blobs of oil reforming. But could you uh, set yourself the challenge of working out why these individual little blobs, they've got a name, by the way, they're called my cells, if I remember correctly, but that's no longer part of the course. It's not obligatory knowledge, but it is quite interesting. And as I said, that is why... Um, the water is slightly cloudy. The reason I'm hoping that you might have come up with is because the surface of these little blobs are now electrically charged as being at negative courtesy of this O-. The sodium, by the way, if you wonder where the sodium went to, it's not gone off to sip champagne on a super yacht. It's simply floating around in the water as the counter ion. It doesn't actually do anything, but yes, they are still there. We haven't created a jar of negative charge. Don't shout at me. The sodium ions are still there. Um... These don't reform, of course, because they are identical charges. So when they come close to each other, they repel. It's super clever chemistry. And that's what enables uh, non-polar oils to be dispersed through the polar water, not actually dissolved in it. <clears throat> when you have dispersed a non-polar substance in a polar substance, then you have created what is called an emulsion. Examples of emulsions include milk, uh, the yolk of an egg, types of paint. These are all called emulsions um, because they are making two things that would not normally mix, mix due to the presence of a special chemical. In this case, a uh, soap molecule. Just a couple of more things. Um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to take us back to this main sheet here, what I wanted to cover. I want to cover what they're made from, done that. I want to cover the properties of the molecule and how do they work, done that. By the way, just as a little bit of real-world chemistry, that's why dishwasher tablets are always surprisingly strong alkalis. Do be very careful with them. Don't let them into the hands of small human beings, because they're actually surprisingly dangerous. Um, alkali dishwasher tablets are alkali, so that all the oils and fats inside your dishwasher can easily... They actually turn into more soap. Now that you realise how that works, which is super cool chemistry, you turn this, chemist this uh, fat or oil here into an actual soap molecule, which helps to clean the other dishes. Um, scum. Let's talk about scum and hard water. Not a thing that we have a problem with in Scotland, but let's talk about what it is and why it's a problem with old-fashioned soaps. 
Here was our soap molecule. I'm just reusing it to be lazy. See me drawing another one. Now, uh, as I said, with this comes from the factory with a sodium ion on here. And everything's peachy keen and it dissolves in water lovely. Unfortunately, some areas of uh, the UK, particularly down south, uh, contain uh, lots of dissolved ions in the tap water. It makes it taste interesting, actually, to be honest. It tastes quite nice. But the problem is these are often group 2 ions. So magnesium and calcium ions. So the group 2 metals, and if you look at the solubility in your data book of group 2 metal compounds, group 1 metal compounds, they dissolve, they're, they're salts, every single salt soluble. These guys, not so much. Calcium sulfate, for example, is what used to go into old-fashioned board chalk if you are old enough like me to remember a chalkboard. Um, so um, calcium and magnesium ions tend to be insoluble. Oh look, if they are in the water and you plunk some soap into the water, you can end up replacing this with these. And if you do that, by the way, let's do this correctly, of course, because that's a two plus charge, you would actually need two of these to counterbalance that. And if you create this, this is now insoluble, which makes two things happen. Number one, your soap doesn't work very well because you can't dissolve it in the water. And number two, this forms scum, sort of grey floaty stuff on the surface of the water. It's disgusting. Um, so, yeah, that is a problem in some areas of the country. Uh, so, how do we get around that? Well, the answer is we invented something called soapless detergents. And the good news is you don't need to know anything about their molecules, so I'm not going to tell you. So, there is a scum problem when the water contains calcium ions or magnesium ions um, with normal old-fashioned bars of soap. And that's why we invented liquid soaps. They are, technically speaking, more detergents. And certainly for cleaning your clothes uh, and your dishwasher, they, are, they all contain soapless detergents to avoid forming scum. Excellent. And that, that's called hard water, by the way. Not water that wants to start a fight with you. Okay, uh, hard, hard water. Uh, it's called hard because it contains dissolved ions. Where on earth do these come from? The answer is they come from limestone rocks. And we don't have an awful lot of that in Scotland. The water doesn't tend to filter through limestone in Scotland. That's why we're missing these ions. Uh, number four, emulsions and emulsifiers. I have actually covered what emulsion is before, um, but I'll remind you, it's uh, when you have small drops of a liquid with one polarity, which is dispersed in a liquid with a different polarity. And the way that we can make this happen is by using chemicals which are emulsifiers. I did give an example of eggs there. Uh, the yolk of an egg contains loads and loads of fats and oils which are required to form your cell membranes. Of course, the cell members of, membranes of the chicken in this case. And um, it's basically dispersed in an aqueous solution. So egg yolks contain natural emulsifying compounds. That's how you're able to make mayonnaise. Once we're back at work... It's one of the hires, one of the practicals I always want to try with my hair class, which is to make mayonnaise. You take a jar, you pop some vegetable oil, you pop a little bit of vinegar, pop some salt in if you want, and then uh, you add some water to it, and then you fire in a few egg yolks, and the egg and whisk it all up, and the egg yolks form an emulsion. I don't know why I put the empty glass there. Sorry, I'm not, it's not as if I'm about to form mayonnaise in my glass. Sorry about that. Um, so the the emulsifiers from the egg yolk uh, make the non-polar uh, vegetable oil and the polar water mix and you end up making mayonnaise. Uh, there's one last... Oh, I remember the last thing I wanted... Yes, the SQA wants you to know this even though the chemistry is wrong and it grinds my teeth. The SQA require you to know that a way of making emulsifiers is by reacting... I have to, actually have to go and check this uh, because it's wrong, and so therefore it doesn't stay in my memory. Make two seconds, please. There we go. Okay, the SQA say that you can make emulsifiers by reacting edible oils with glycerol. And they say... Glycerol, sorry. And they, being the SQA, say that because you are partially replacing the OH groups on the glycerol with big long fatty acid chains you create a molecule which is a non-polar component and a polar component the only problem is that reaction is utter junk 
because edible oils are esters and esters don't react with glycerol because the glycerol has already formed the edible oil in the first place. So this is a common one mark question. I almost hate to tell you in incorrect chemistry. I've tried to question the SQ in this. Never got an answer back from them. So that is as covered, I think, for fats and oils turning into soaps, emulsions and detergents. So quick recap. Soaps are made from, ironically, fats or oils with alkaline hydrolysis. And a soap is basically a salt of the fatty acid from the fat. Uh, they have got a dual uh, property uh, nature to them. They have a large non-polar section and a tiny polar bit at the end. Uh, they enable you to form an emulsion of oils with water, which is tiny droplets of the non-polar oil dispersed in the water. Go back to the video and it'll tell you exactly. That, by the way, that's a, cr that's a frequent open-ended question. And it's great because you can show it diagrammatically. You don't have to write screeds and screeds of, of writing. Um, what's the problem with scum in some areas of the country? Uh, it's basically an, it's an insoluble version of the soap molecule. How do we get around that problem? We use what are called soapless detergents, which don't form the scum. Um, and emulsions and emulsifiers, well, yeah, I'm not going to talk anymore about that. I'll get upset. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye-bye.